have a confession to make. One that may surprise you, given that I'm stood here on the TED stage today. And now, I've spoken at places like the United Nations and shared speaking platforms with the likes of Michelle Obama and Hillary Clinton. But the thing that I'm about to reveal is something that I actually still can't quite believe. I hated public speaking. I was an event manager for over 10 years, and as part of my role, I had to open and close events and introduce and thank speakers. And even though there was a process to follow, I just really hated that part of my job. But otherwise, it was a really exciting and really fulfilling career. And I really loved that I got to challenge people's perceptions about me just doing something that I really, really loved. But the path that led me to choose a career in event management wasn't a strategic one, nor was it my childhood dream. It was as a result of being rejected from over 100 jobs at the age of 16. And it wasn't until I removed any mention of my condition from my applications was I then offered an interview and I got a job straight away. So I felt that I had to go to university to have a degree to fall back on, because if I'd struggled to get a part-time, entry-level job that needed no qualifications, how on earth was I going to survive? It left me feeling hopeless. I always wanted to live an independent life, and I knew that without meaningful employment, I'd always have to live at home with my parents. Don't get me wrong, I love them to bits. <laughs> but that's I wanted more for my life. And I even ended up thinking, who's going to die first, me or them? So I chose a degree in event management because I was always the person in my family, I still am actually, that plans all the parties, the get-togethers. And I just chose something that I enjoyed. And not only did I work part-time at university, I did three years of free work experience because I didn't want to give my prospective employers a single reason to not hire me. But despite having every desire to want to work, negative perceptions and bias against employing disabled people and our perceived lack of productivity, or perhaps being risky hires, meant that I was continually being rejected and then overcompensating just to get in and stay in work. But it turns out I was pretty good at my job, and that's thanks to my short stature. Because I live in a world that isn't designed for me, so I have to think outside of the box every single day. I have to figure out how I'm going to reach my kitchen cupboards, to how I'm going to find clothes and get them to fit me. Isn't it so ironic that I have the perfect skill set for a job like an event manager, but just look at the lengths that I had to go to to get there? And lately, I've been really reflecting on that experience, the irony, so much so that it's actually comical. Isn't it ironic that I experience the physical pain from my condition and I live in an inaccessible society to the point where I can't find accessible housing, I can't use public transport and I struggle to get a job, but everybody else around me ends up feeling awkward or nervous around disabled people? I've been asked if I'm pregnant more times by medical professionals than the amount of conversations that I've ever been included in about sex, dating, kids, marriage, within my social circles. Or how about the irony that those of us from ethnic minority backgrounds are actually more predisposed to disability, but we are not as equally represented as our white British counterparts. I've only ever seen four disabled people of colour on my screen, not including me. 
And a big reason this happens is because as a society, we're fearful when it comes to disability. Research by the disability charity Scope has found that 67% of Brits admitted to feeling uncomfortable when talking to a disabled person. Now, I think people are scared of disability because it actually reflects their own fragility. The fact that it's a very human experience, it can happen to anyone at any time, even you, is something that most people find unbearable. But being disabled isn't something to be fearful of. An ableist society is, because ableism harms us all. As a disability inclusion specialist, activist and entrepreneur, I work with businesses and brands and I help them to become more inclusive. I was born with a rare genetic condition. It's called osteogenesis imperfecta, and that's why I have a short stature of 3 foot 10. But the condition that I was born with doesn't disable me. The barriers and the bias that I face do. Negative attitudes and inaccessible design are major barriers for many disabled people to live independently, to be connected with others, to be confident, and just to live the lives that they want to live. But it doesn't have to be this way. Because if we all use the principles of inclusive or universal design at the heart of the decisions and the things that we design, then we'd be much more successful in making most things accessible to the whole range of human diversity that exists in the world. Yet many of us base decisions that affect society based on our own knowledge and biases. Because the fact is, is that we all have abilities and limits to those abilities. So if we design things universally in an inclusive way, then a lot more of us will be able to access things without ever having the need to have to ask for adjustments. And that's the world that I want to live in. Let's face it, we're not talking about a small group of people here. We're all living longer as a society and developing chronic health conditions at a much younger age. At least 22% of the UK population already lives with a condition or an impairment. That's one in five of us. So believe me when I say we are already overlooking the needs of this community. A community that has an incredible spending power worth £274 billion to the UK economy. So the fact that we aren't including disabled people purely for commercial reasons, let alone moral reasons, just goes to show how we as disabled people are so misunderstood. And as an inclusion practitioner, I've come to learn that the world's primary approach to inclusion is to expect oppressed and marginalised groups to be really inspiring and to remove all the barriers that they did not put in place. And you're lucky if you get paid to do it. But guess what? We're still oppressed and we're still marginalised. And that's because we don't have the privilege or the power to make the necessary and urgent interventions that are required to create equitable change. Diversity, equity and inclusion aren't merely somebody's job title. It's everybody's responsibility. And until we don't get on the same page and have the same level of understanding that our individual behaviours, attitudes and mindsets have an impact on the lives of people that live in our society, then nothing will ever change. Your privilege has power. And that power is being put to work whether you're intentional about how you use it or not. So why not use it for the greater good instead of just feeling guilty about it?
So what now? What can you do to help change the world and make it more inclusive? Well, one of the biggest barriers that I think we have in society is that if we share our privilege with other people, then we think there's none left for us. But it's not pie. <laughs> it's not a zero-sum game where one person's gain is equivalent to another person's loss. Every single decision that we make can either raise or lower barriers to participation in society. And it's in our own self-interest to be allies to people from marginalised and oppressed groups because ultimately our own struggles are tied to everybody else's. You have the power to change the way that people experience the world. And every interaction is an expression of the responsibility for the power that you have. There are so many ways that you can commit to equitable change now and for future generations to come. What action will you take? Thank you.